This is a sickening truth behind the That 70s Show. Okay, so Danny Masterson, who played Steven in That 70s Show, just got sentenced to 30 years to life in prison for rape. He was first accused of sexual misconduct in 2017, which kicked off an investigation by the LAPD. And in June 2020, he was charged with raping three women, including his former girlfriend, in his Hollywood Hills home between 2001 and 2003. But a clip has recently gone viral of Conan O'Brien telling Danny Masterson that he will be caught for what he's doing in 2004. Just watch this clip because it's absolutely insane. Like my friend Buddy Elfman, he always teases me and he says, Hi, my name is Danny Masterson. Would you like to touch my balls? <laughs> you know, being an imitation of me. Because certain so words why are you, you asking people with. to do that? That's the more important question. I mean, you got them. <laughs> yeah, right, right. You know what I mean? Accent aside. Everybody can grab them. That's the more important thing. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I've heard about you, uh, and you'll be caught soon. I know you will. I will. So yeah, do you think that was just all a coincidence, or did Conan O'Brien know what he was doing? This true crime case from Northern Ireland is heartbreaking. 21-year-old Chloe Mitchell was from Ballymena. She vanished on the 2nd of June, 2023. She'd been out that evening and was spotted on CCTV heading towards James Street in the early hours of the morning. She was reported missing and understandably her family were absolutely beside themselves. On the 9th of June, police confirmed that they'd launched a criminal investigation. Then two days later came the news that the family were absolutely dreading. Human remains had been discovered at a nearby flat in James Street. They were then formally identified as Chloe's. Police revealed that she did suffer a violent death, but they have not yet released to the public how she died. Her family, though, have been made aware. 26-year-old Brandon Rainey was arrested on suspicion of her murder. His defence applied for him to be held in a secure mental health unit due to the fact that he's a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. He is known to have been an inpatient at the facility before. Chloe's family is understandably heartbroken and the local community have all come together to grieve the young woman. Does Family Guy know something that we don't know? Carter, you found a cure for cancer? Well, I didn't come up with it. A couple of eggheads I hired did. One of them's a Chinese. Boy, I don't like those people. But holy crap, wind them up and watch them go. How long have you had this? I don't know. When, when was that Who Let the Dogs Out song? You've had this since 1999? You know when Who Let the Dogs Out came out? It's a song about dogs and letting them out. I could have you arrested for breaking in here. Carter, you've discovered the holy grail of modern medicine. Why the hell would you keep it buried like this? I'll tell you why. Because there's far more money to be made in treating a disease than in curing it. Why cure someone of cancer in a day if we can treat them for a lifetime and bill them every step along the way? What? That's insane! Carter? What you're doing here is criminal, and I'm going to tell the whole world about it. Is that right? Who's going to believe you? The internet? You'll be just another nutjob left-wing blogger. Security? So yeah, I find this extremely interesting. Because everything is done on purpose, and not everything is a joke. So what do you think? Do you think Family Guy knows that we found a cure for cancer? Or do you think they're just trying to get people talking like I'm doing right now? Either way, this is extremely mind-blowing, and just imagine we did have a cure for cancer, and they're just holding on to it for more money. This is an incredibly disturbing true crime update from New York. A one-year-old child has been killed, and three other children remain in hospital after substance paraphernalia was found at a nursery in the Bronx. The New York Police Department received a call on the 15th of September regarding three unconscious children. Four children that were in the care of the staff at the Divino Nino daycare appeared to have come into contact with a substance that led to hospitalisation of three of the children. We know that disturbingly one child was dead on arrival and the cause of death is believed to be a direct result of the interaction with the substance. Police stated all three children were unresponsive and demonstrating symptoms of O exposure. A life-saving substance was administered to all three of these children in an attempt to save their lives. The children in hospital are thought to be an eight-month-old girl, a one-year-old boy and a two-year-old boy. Following the 911 call, the police inspected the nursery. Disturbingly, they found a kilo press. Now, if you aren't aware, this is an item that is commonly used by substance dealers when packing large quantities of substances. This man was sucked into a plane engine and whatever you do, don't look up the pictures. This is the Air Astana 2004 incident, which is one of the most shocking and tragic events in the history of aviation. 
The victim was Igor Yelfimov and he was sucked into the plane's engine while he was working near the aircraft. The horrific incident occurred on July 13th, 2004 and it was captured on CCTV video and the video has recently resurfaced on the internet sparking renewed interest and curiosity among the viewers. Igor was a 26 year old maintenance engineer and he was preparing the aircraft for a flight from Moscow when the engine suddenly turned on and he was then sucked into the engine of the Boeing 737. Right when this happens, he completely disappears and blood and body parts go everywhere. All over the airport runway is bits and pieces of Igor and it's an extremely disturbing sight. The video is extremely shocking and gory and I really don't recommend looking it up. One second Igor was there and the next he was just completely erased. I never really understood the power and how dangerous plane engines are until I saw this video. We all heard about wood chipping incidents and workplace incidents, but somebody getting sucked into a plane engine is definitely a first for me. Again, I want to say I don't recommend looking it up or watching it, but if you do, this is a massive trigger warning. Police arrived to this murder scene to find a five-year-old waving a loaded weapon. Adam Simji and his girlfriend, Michaela Paulus, really enjoyed hiking. In August 2022, the couple had embarked on a road trip through Alabama. They wanted to make the most of the time that they had together prior to starting classes at Florida Uni. As they were driving through the Talladega National Forest, they came across a woman at the side of the road. She seemed to be after their help. The woman in question was 21-year-old Yasmeen Hyder. She had apparently broken down not far away and asked the pair to help her. They followed her to the car and then out of the blue she pulled a gun out. She told them to empty their pockets and follow her into the woods. Adam actually told her that all of their valuables were in the van and she was welcome to take them. He then also pulled his gun out and the pair opened fire. Yasmin shot him in the abdomen and killed him. Yasmin was also shot four times. Michaela grabbed her phone and called emergency services. She also attempted CPR on her boyfriend. She was desperately trying to stop the blood flow coming from the wound. Shockingly, when police turned up to the crime scene, they found a five-year-old boy with a loaded weapon. The child was Yasmin's son. Luckily, the child put the weapon down and Yasmin and an accomplice, Crystal Pinkins, were arrested. The child was obviously taken away by authorities. Yasmin received 35 years in prison and Crystal is yet to have her trial. These parents killed their kids because they thought they would come back to life. Okay, so it was late COVID period and the older sister Alikia, who was 27, learned some superstition rituals online and read many books. And she started taking it extremely seriously and convinced her parents and younger sister to believe her. Now there's two sides of the story that could have happened. One, the parents believed the two daughters were possessed by some spirits and they just killed them hoping they'd come back to life. And the other and most popular one is that Alikia convinced both of her parents to kill her and her sister because they will come back to life. The parents then bludgeoned their two daughters to death, believing full heartedly that they will come back to life within 24 hours. Her younger sister was hit in the head to death by a dumbbell and Alikia was killed by a trident. And after killing both of their kids, the parents just patiently waited for their daughters to come back to life. That's when the police walked in on the gruesome scene and arrested them. This might just sound so insane you might not believe that people could actually do something like this, but it was a time in the world where everything was extremely fragile and nobody knew what was going on. So this family literally just went down a rabbit hole on rituals and spells, and completely believed it and acted on it. This case is extremely disturbing and I know a bunch of you have never heard about it, so let's talk about it. This Derbyshire crime case is horrific. Police were called to a house in Killamarsh in 2021. It was 7.26 a.m. on the 19th of September. What they were told when they arrived stunned them. Outside was Damien Bendel. He chillingly told police that he'd murdered four people inside of the house. He was arrested at the scene and what officers discovered would haunt them. 35-year-old Terry Harris had lived in the house along with her children, 13-year-old John Paul Bennett and 11-year-old Lacey Bennett. Also deceased inside the property was Lacey's best friend, 11-year-old Connie Ghent, who'd been there for a sleepover. Damien and Terry had been in a relationship after meeting on a dating website. Prior to the murders, and this is a massive, massive trigger warning for animals here, Damien had bragged that a friend couldn't afford to take their dog to the vet, so he'd killed it using a brick. 
He was a known substance user and used a lot of CO and CA. On the day in question, the four victims were found deceased in the house with their skulls crushed. He had awed 11 year old Lacey as she died. After the killings, he went to town to get more substances and was spotted on CCTV going to a shop to buy tobacco. He took John Paul's Xbox and traded it in for substances. When making polite conversation with Damien, a cab driver reported that he told him his night had been a bit mad. He was given a whole life order in prison and the house has since been demolished. The story of the School of Rock pedophile is one of the most disturbing things I've ever read about. Meet Jason James Murphy, a former Hollywood casting agent who, before he worked as a casting agent for children, had been convicted of one of the most terrible crimes I've read about. So when Jason was just 19 years old, he was in college at the time, he kidnapped an 8-year-old boy, held him hostage, and repeatedly assaulted him. He had met the boy while he was working as a camp counselor, and he eventually served 5 years in prison, and was obviously required to register as a sex offender for the rest of his life. But in 2005, just a few years after Jason got out of prison, he moved to California, and that's when he started working in Hollywood. Jason was a casting agent for a number of huge films. He worked by helping to cast the children in the film School of Rock. He also helped to cast the film Cheaper by the Dozen, which obviously has a lot of kids in it. And he worked on a number of different movies, including stuff like Super 8 by J.J. Abrams. Now, apparently, people didn't really know about his past, which I think is really strange because if they were actually doing background checks on the people that they hired, they would see that this man had served five years in prison. But in 2011, he was rearrested for failing to file a name change. Now, he was arrested again in 2011 after he had worked on all these movies because he failed to file a name change and a change of address with the government. But he had apparently been working for years under a different name. And I mean, this guy was trying to outrun his sordid past, but with such a horrible crime that you've committed, you can never outrun that. And I don't know if he's still working with Hollywood, working around kids, but I really hope that he's not. This is the most unsettling and eerie video you will ever watch. What I'm about to show you is the most realistically colored and stabilized version of Jack Talisio's extremely eerie 9-11 footage. It was taken at the base of the South Tower in the Austin J. Tobin Plaza, and a version of Billy Joel's She's Always a Woman is playing in the background. There's something about this video that makes it extremely unsettling and you will pick up on it very easily. There's just so much chaos and destruction and somehow it seems peaceful. What you just saw was the cast of Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide making fun of Drake Bell and his allegations of extremely brutal sexual assault. This clip is one of the more shocking things that I've seen lately and it's just extremely distasteful. If you didn't know, Ned's Declassified was another show that was airing on Nickelodeon at the same time that all of this sexual assault and creepiness was going on behind the scenes. But in the clip from that podcast, the three cast members state that they actually never had anything weird happen on their set, which they believe entitles them to make fun of survivors of sexual assault that had it happen on their sets. Now, in the video itself, Devin, aka Ned, actually tries to backtrack right away, but he said this live in front of hundreds of people, and it has completely blown up in his face. This is shocking because Drake Bell recently went public with his allegations of sexual assault at Nickelodeon. 
And after seeing that footage, Drake Bell actually tweeted out a response to it, saying, Ned's declassless. This is wild. Laugh it up, guys. Laugh it up. Give me your holes. Really? I mean, all of this is really disturbing, but to me, it's not that shocking because as you can see a year ago, I made a TikTok exposing Brian Peck, wanting to open up conversations about how this guy probably had more victims that were more famous than you might think. And I mean, yeah, I couldn't think of a more insensitive way to deal with a topic like this that affected people that were on the same network as you that you were probably friends with. I mean, what the hell? Tortured, dehumanized, and ultimately beaten to death. In less than 18 months, Shakira Spencer went from a happy, healthy size 16 to a skeletal, gaunt size 6. The mother of two died after being starved, tortured and beaten by these three individuals. Shakira had actually known her killers for quite some time. Ashana Studholm, pictured here in the middle, was her former neighbour and she subdued and dominated Shakira along with her boyfriend Sean and their friend Lisa until she was under their complete control. They subjected Shakira to 18 months of torture, humiliation and starvation. They burnt the soles of her feet and they fed her only takeaway sachets of tomato sauce. They prostituted her and they took complete control of all her finances and money. Eventually, in September 2022, Shakira was beaten to the brink of death. But instead of taking her to hospital, they put her in the boot of the car, drove her back to her own house and locked her inside a cupboard where she died. Eventually, neighbours noticed flies at the windows and maggots coming from under the front door and they called the police. This is when Shakira's body was discovered. That evening, a relative of Sean's phoned the police saying that he'd confessed to killing a woman along with his girlfriend Ashana and their friend Lisa. They were all arrested and when police searched their phones, they found hundreds of messages between the three of them referring to Shakira and the abuse and actual videos of Shakira being beaten and tortured while the three of them laughed in the background. They were all sentenced on March 1st, 2024, and they received life sentences with a minimum of 34 years each. This is Lucy Letby, a 33-year-old nurse who's just been accused of murdering seven infants and attempting to kill 10 more. This is what we know so far. Lucy was a nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Chester, England. Dating back to 2015, a doctor at the hospital started noticing unusual and unexplainable things happening in the neonatal unit, such as multiple infants either collapsing or dying. Sometimes this would happen in just the span of a month. During that time, Nurse Lucy would be assigned to the infants and working. But suspicions really didn't start until April of 2016, when a six-week premature boy, referred to as Child M, suddenly stopped breathing and collapsed. Doctors spent 25 minutes resuscitating him via CPR and giving him multiple doses of adrenaline. Luckily, he was stabilized and placed on a ventilator. However, the doctor on call noticed bright pink blotches on the infant's torso that would appear and disappear. And once he was stabilized, they completely vanished. It wasn't known at the time, but oxygen had actually been injected into the baby's bloodstream. Lucy was the assigned nurse to take care of him that evening, and she noted that the infant was experiencing symptoms similar to that of the brain being starved of oxygen. But later brain scans determined that that wasn't true. Just hours later, Child M's twin brother, referred to as Child L, also collapsed and started to deteriorate after Nurse Lucy was assigned to him. And like his brother, Child L had also been attacked, but this time he was injected with a dose of insulin. Luckily, both brothers survived, but this prompted a doctor at the hospital to begin an investigation into what was happening. And to his surprise, he discovered multiple infant deaths at the hospital consistent with air embolism dating back to 2015. And Lucy was at the center of it all. Lucy was arrested in 2018, and shortly after, authorities found multiple post-it notes in her home in which she had written things like, quote, I am evil, and I killed them on purpose, end quote. Lucy is facing 22 charges and has been accused of killing seven infants and attempting to kill 10 more. It was reported that she used various methods to harm the infants, like injecting them with oxygen and insulin, but also feeding them an excessive amount of milk. Lucy has since pleaded not guilty, and the case remains ongoing. 11-year-old Jaden Perkins is being remembered as an absolute hero after he died defending his pregnant mother. The attacker was his mother's ex-boyfriend and shockingly, he'd only been out of prison for 24 hours when he attacked Jaden and his mum, Letera. 
Jaden, his mum Latera, who is 33 weeks pregnant, and his little brother were just getting ready to leave for school. When they opened the door, Crosetti Brand was stood there with a knife and he immediately launched an attack on Latera. He stabbed her multiple times before Jaden actually jumped in front of her to protect her. Crosetti then stabbed him fatally in the chest. He then fled the scene and Jaden and Latera were rushed to hospital. Jaden passed away and Latera is said to be in a stable condition, as is her unborn baby. Crosetti Brand had actually been sentenced to 16 years due to an assault on an ex-girlfriend and her son. He only served half that sentence and he was released in October last year. He had dated Jaden's mother 15 years prior and she actually had an order of protection out against him. He had a history of domestic violence against Latera and he had actually violated an order of protection three times in 2008. Following his release in October, she actually had another order of protection out against him, but that didn't stop him. He was threatening her over texts and he was turning up at their apartment. He had rung the doorbell and pulled on the door handle to try and gain access, but left when he'd found it locked. She contacted the parole board about the harassment and he was rearrested, but he was again paroled on March 12th, the day before he murdered Jaden. This man was clearly a danger to this family and shouldn't have been allowed anywhere near them. He has now been charged with first degree murder, attempted first degree murder, home invasion and domestic battery and he is due to appear in court on April 3rd. Jaden is being remembered as the positive, compassionate 11 year old that he was. His positive energy and enthusiasm were contagious and he'll be remembered by all who knew him. What you're about to watch is extremely disturbing, so watch at your own risk. That was a woman who earlier this month escaped her kidnapper after being held captive for the last year. As seen in the video, she made her escape to a gas station in Burlington County, New Jersey, and following close behind trying to catch her was her abductor. The woman's identity has been withheld for her safety, but her kidnapper is 57-year-old James Perillo Jr. According to authorities, the woman met James at a gas station in New Mexico in February of last year during a cross-country road trip. James told her that his name was Brett Parker and asked her for a ride to Arizona, in which she agreed. According to her, for the first month they were in a consensual relationship, but it wasn't long after that that he began assaulting her. He took away her phone and debit cards and isolated her from her family. He then spent the next year holding the woman captive and traveling with her throughout the country. In the weeks before she escaped, the two had visited a gas station in New Jersey that was close to a room that James had rented out in Bass River Township. And it was there that she noticed that the store had an interior deadbolt. It was at this point that she began plotting her escape. The day she escaped, James had been beating and choking her, and she somehow broke free and made a run for it back to that gas station. It was only 42 degrees out, and she was wearing only a t-shirt and shorts with no shoes. When she got inside of the store, she immediately locked the door, and it's a really good thing she did because James was right behind her. Luckily, he didn't get in, though. The woman told the attendant that she had been kidnapped and held captive for the last year and that she needed help. She had deep cuts and marks on her neck. James was caught and arrested that same day, which was February 7th. He's being held at the Burlington County Jail with no bail because, according to authorities, they found evidence online that he may have had other victims in the past. He's been charged with first-degree kidnapping, second-degree strangulation, and aggravated assault, amongst many other charges. If convicted, he faces up to 47 years in prison and a fine of nearly half a million dollars. Jeanette McCurdy has come out and made some pretty disturbing allegations about her time spent working at Nickelodeon and people are convinced that they're about Dan Schneider. So if you remember in 2022, Jeanette released her memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died. And her book, which is a great read, dives into some really dark territory. But I wanna talk about the times that she mentioned someone called the creator. In her book, Jeanette references the creator a number of times, and people have jumped to the conclusion that the creator may be referring to Dan Schneider, the man who created a bunch of the most popular shows on Nickelodeon. A man who has been called a creep many, many times. So let's talk about the book. In the book, Jeanette says that the creator tried to persuade her to drink alcohol many times when she was a minor and would say to her, come on, the kids from Victorious get drunk together all the time. 
She also claims that the creator gave her an unwanted shoulder massage. This is a quote from her book. She said, I want to say something to tell him to stop, but I'm so scared of offending him. Now, these connections are all alleged, keep in mind, but it has come out and this has been confirmed that Dan Schneider would have extremely angry outbursts on set. And people who worked for him were consistently afraid of him. And I want to remind you, we still don't know who the creator is. But something else extremely compelling is that Jeanette says she was offered $300,000 by Nickelodeon to never go public about her experiences behind the scenes with the creator. But she denied this payoff. And this is a quote from her in the book. She says, I'm glad I didn't take it because I'm able to talk about it and I don't have to have that secret haunt me. So who exactly is the creator? People still have no idea. But it is crazy. Nickelodeon offered her $300,000 preemptively to stop her from talking about her experiences with this mysterious man. And what exactly happened? I mean, I, we might never know. But $300,000 is a pretty big payoff, and whatever the creator did must have been pretty bad. The only one that can really reveal all of this is Jeanette McCurdy herself. This case will make you terrified to leave work. It was the 22nd of November 2003. Drew Shadin was leaving work for the day. She worked in a shopping centre in a Victoria's Secret in North Dakota. She was an incredibly popular woman, and she was actually homecoming queen and a member of a sorority. As she left work that day, she rang her boyfriend. Now, during the conversation, he heard Drew state, okay, okay, and then the phone went dead. He presumed maybe she'd bumped into somebody that she knew or the signal had just dropped. He waited, but didn't actually hear back from her for three hours. At that point, he received a call off her number and all he could hear was a fuzzy sound and the sound of buttons being pressed. It became apparent that something was seriously wrong when Drew didn't turn up to her second job that she was scheduled to attend. Terrifyingly, when her car was found in the car park, police noticed a knife sheath next to it. Police attempted to scour the CCTV to try and put together Drew's movements. They figured out she was abducted just four minutes into her phone call. Chillingly, when they looked on CCTV, they could see a man following her. They identified him as a known S offender, Alfonso Rodriguez. Terrifyingly, he had an extensive history of violence against women. Shockingly, he'd actually been released from prison not long before this. This was despite being labelled as likely to reoffend. Even his own family had expressed their concerns about him being released. Now, he attempted to use the alibi of having been at the cinema at the time of the abduction. However, the film that he said he was watching wasn't actually being shown at any local cinemas that day. When they searched his vehicle, they found something very disturbing. There was a knife that had clearly been cleaned and also drops of Drew's blood. Police arrested him on suspicion of murder. In April 2004, her body was finally discovered. She was found without clothes on along the Red Lake River. Up until April, it had actually been quite bad weather. There was snow, there was frost. So this may have been why it took so long to find her. She had multiple knife wounds and had been SA'd before her death. Alfonso originally got the death penalty, but this was then changed to life in prison after appeal. Drew's law came into place after her killing and a scholarship was set up in her memory. I may fail, but if I fail, I want to die trying. We're all going to die anyways. It's just a matter of how and when. Only moments after that video was recorded, Pedro Ruiz was shot dead with a desert eagle. All of this was captured on camera as a part of his first YouTube video. So this all happened in 2017. Pedro and his girlfriend, Mona Lisa, had been dating for a while. They had a child together. And at the time that this video was recorded, Mona Lisa was pregnant with their second child. Pedro had big dreams of becoming a YouTuber. And he thought he could really break into the YouTube scene by having his girlfriend shoot him in the chest with a desert eagle. Pedro believed that by holding a thick book in front of him, he could stop the bullet. This is an actual crime scene photo of the book that was used in the filming of this video and you can see that it clearly did not stop the bullet. Right before this video was filmed, Mona Lisa tweeted out, Me and Pedro are probably going to shoot one of the most dangerous videos ever. His idea, not mine. A lot of this footage is online, but you can see Pedro taking out the Golden Desert Eagle, waving it around. But investigators have never released the footage of the actual fatal shot that took his life. Sadly, you can see in the transcript of the video, though, that Mona Lisa was extremely hesitant to do this. 
In the first place, she hadn't wanted to shoot her boyfriend with a gun. She had been pressured into it. And in the footage, she says, Babe, I'm not doing this. I can't. If I kill you, what's going to happen to my life? Like, no, this isn't okay. And Pedro in the transcript keeps reassuring her, saying, As long as you hit the book, you'll be fine. Well, sadly, Mona Lisa did hit the book with the bullet. It was actually a pretty accurate shot there. But unfortunately, the bullet went straight through the book and took Pedro's life. Now, afterwards, Mona Lisa was left alone with their two children, and she was eventually sentenced to a 180-day jail term. But ever since the accident, Mona Lisa has really tried to turn her life around. She's actively talked about this whole situation. She's still active on social media. And I have to say, I actually went to school with Mona Lisa when I was younger, and she was a great person. I couldn't believe that this happened. I couldn't believe seeing this on the news. And yeah, just what a tragic story for all parties involved. And also, if you like true crime stories, listen to the podcast that my wife and I co-host, Murder in America, available on all streaming platforms. This teenager killed his teacher in the school toilets. Philip Chisholm was 14 years old. It was autumn 2013 and he'd recently moved areas. He'd been living in Tennessee and had to move to Massachusetts. His mum was going through a really difficult divorce and at the time Philip was said to be quite reclusive. Colleen Ritzer was one of the teachers at his school. She was always positive and encouraging of students and Philip was no exception. Colleen had actually been heard to be complimenting Philip on his artwork in class but he seemed to then have a problem with her mentioning his recent move. He became visibly upset and she tried to change the subject. She thought that this was the end of this awkward encounter. It was the morning of the 22nd of October and CCTV picked up Philip arriving at school. He was carrying several bags, which no one knew at the time were actually filled with a box cutter, mask, gloves, and a change of clothes. Later that day, Colleen was also captured on CCTV, leaving her classroom to go to the toilet. It was roughly around 3 p.m. Philip was again captured on CCTV, but this time he was following Colleen and pulling his hood up. Chillingly, he put gloves on and stalked her into the toilets. Stealing her phone and her bank card off her, he launched a hideous attack. He awed her and then stabbed her 16 times with the weapons he'd packed. A student even apparently walked in halfway through but saw a pile of clothes on the floor and presumed somebody was trying to get changed. Less than 10 minutes after following her into the bathroom, he left the school, got changed and came back wearing a white top. Shockingly, he went back into the toilets and left pulling a bin which housed Colleen's body. He took the bin into a wooded area behind the school and shockingly SA'd Colleen's body again. When both individuals were missing after school, the police got involved. They found Colleen's blood in the toilets and blood-soaked clothes near a path in the woods. When they examined CCTV, they made Philip a suspect. Meanwhile, Philip was using his teacher's bank card to buy a cinema ticket. When he left the cinema, he stole a knife from a shop and was then obviously stopped by police. They found Colleen's ID and purse on him, as well as the incriminating murder weapon. He admitted to police where he had buried her, and when police discovered Colleen's body, a note lay next to her. The note simply said, I hate you all. He was tried as an adult and sentenced to at least 40 years in prison. Hammer, coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. I have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer and cannibal. Creepy Nickelodeon showrunner Dan Schneider just released an interesting statement. Obviously, in the past week or so, Dan Schneider has been under extreme scrutiny because of the kids' shows that he worked on and the pedophiles that were employed and worked for him. Dan Schneider in the past has been scrutinized himself for his extremely creepy behavior. I'm sure you've seen the Ariana Grande clips that are floating around that he produced. There have also been countless stories of Dan's bizarre behavior on set, him allegedly asking minors for shoulder rubs and other things, and rumors have been floating around for years that he's a creep. Well, Nickelodeon parted ways with Dan Schneider years ago when these allegations started to surface. But because of the renewed attention brought to Nickelodeon through the new series that was released, Dan Schneider felt like he needed to make a statement on all this. So here's what his representative had to say. I'm going to read you this statement. Everything that happened on the shows Dan ran was carefully scrutinized by dozens of involved adults and approved by the network. 
if there was an actual problem with the scenes that some people now years later are sexualizing, they would be taken down, but they are not. They are aired constantly all over the world today still, enjoyed by both kids and parents. So I'm gonna stop that right there for a second. Dan Schneider's statement, his representative is blaming us for sexualizing the scenes, the viewer. Not taking any blame for including or putting this content in there in the first place. The statement then continues. Remember, all stories, dialogue, costumes, and makeup were fully approved by network executives on two coasts. A standards and practices group read and ultimately approved every script and programming executives reviewed and approved all episodes. In addition, every day on every set, there were always parents and caregivers and their friends watching filming and rehearsals. The statement concludes with them saying, Unfortunately, some adults project their adult minds onto kids' shows, drawing false conclusions about them. That statement should offend not only you, but your intelligence as well. Dan Schneider is basically saying that we, the viewers, are the ones that are creating these problems with the content that don't exist. He's basically gaslighting us. He's saying that we are seeing things in the content that don't exist. All you have to do is go watch the videos with Ariana Grande, for example. That's just one of so many examples. By the way, I posted them on my TikTok. And you will see that we are not making things up here. I don't know. I just thought this was an extremely bizarre move from Dan to actually make this specific statement. And I don't know. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with Dan that we are just seeing things and that none of the content at all is inappropriate? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. And if you like true crime content, then you should listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. This true crime case will make your blood boil. Over a decade ago, 19-year-old Cara Nichols vanished. The teenager was born and raised in Colorado Springs and unfortunately had begun using substances throughout high school. She was reported missing on the 14th of October 2012. At this point, her roommates hadn't heard from her for five days. Police soon learned that she'd actually spoken to her brother on the phone on the 9th of October at around 11.45pm. She told him that she was on her way to a modelling shoot. The next day, unsettlingly, her phone was going straight to answer phone. It was actually her brother that ended up travelling to her apartment to figure out what was going on. He spoke to her roommates and the alarm was raised. Now, Cara's laptop was actually still at her apartment, which was concerning because if she just decided to up and left, she wouldn't have left her laptop behind. When investigators started digging into the case, they found that Cara had been placing ads as an S worker. Interestingly, she'd actually posted an ad with her phone number on it the same day she went missing. Police also found out that her phone had been used on that day too at almost midnight. Investigators started looking into exactly which numbers she'd received calls from and set about contacting the individuals. They got a return call of Joel Hollendorfer. He admitted to police that yes, he had spoke to the girl about S services, but they'd never ended up meeting. However, when police tracked Cara's phone, her last activity was in the area of Joel's parents' house. Police ended up searching at the property with a cadaver dog. Disturbingly, the dog barked in loads of different areas on the property to indicate remains. However, the owner of the property stated that this must be just because they have a lot of animals and over the years the animals die and then they bury them in the back garden. The police were happy with this explanation and gave up on the search. They also, though, decided to interview Joel's wife, who strangely declined to cooperate with the investigation. Frustratingly, Cara's case went cold. On February the 8th, 2022, a decade after she went missing, police confirmed that they had found Cara's body. It was on that property they'd searched the whole time. Joel was obviously arrested. In February 2022, his wife decided to come clean to police. She told them that Joel had told her in 2014 that he accidentally killed an escort that he'd hired. He admitted that he accidentally strangled her to death and buried her near a dead horse on the property. Joel's defence in court claimed that he accidentally killed her in an S act gone wrong and that she lost consciousness due to substance use. Shockingly, he was only convicted of manslaughter and got just 24 years in prison. This was a huge blow to Kara's family. I'm soaking wet! Quick, somebody bring me the ocean! 
The clips from videos that Dan Schneider made Ariana Grande perform in are disturbing. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to show you some more throughout this video, but I want to inform you of something first. This is Dan Schneider, the showrunner for Nickelodeon and the biggest creep of all time, in my opinion. He was the one that made sure that these scenes were filmed, and it was his idea to film them. And just yesterday, Dan Schneider's representative released a statement. This is a quote from Dan Schneider's representative. They said, Everything that happened on the shows Dan ran was carefully scrutinized by dozens of involved adults and approved by the network. If there was an actual problem with the scenes that some people, now years later, are sexualizing, they would be taken down. But they are not. They are aired constantly all over the world today still, enjoyed by both kids and parents. They go on to say, Remember, all stories, dialogue, costumes, and makeup were fully approved by network executives on two coasts. A standards and practices group read and ultimately approved every script and programming executives reviewed and approved all episodes. In addition, every day on every set, there were always parents and caregivers and their friends watching filming and rehearsals. And his representative ends with this. Unfortunately, some adults project their adult minds onto kids' shows, drawing false conclusions about them. I guess I am some adult who has projected my mind onto this footage, and I guess I'm seeing it wrong. At least that's what Dan Schneider wants you to think. That statement is incredibly bizarre. I mean, Dan's really trying to clear his name as hard as he can. He said that none of the footage that they've ever shot was intended to be perceived in any adult or weird way. Now let me show you the rest of these Ariana Grande clips, and you tell me if you think that's actually the case. Because I think that Dan Schneider is lying through his teeth. But once again, I'm going to show you these clips. You let me know. Oh, man, my uvula got stuck between that hamster's toes. See? That could never happen because your uvula is that swingy thing in the back of your throat right here. So there's no way you could get us stuck between a hamster's toes. Sentence number three. Ah! I'm soaking wet. Quick, somebody bring me the ocean. No one would ever say that. Why? Because if you were soaking wet and you were upset about it, the last thing you'd want is for somebody to bring you the ocean. Because the ocean is even more wet than even the wettest person in the world. Have you ever tried to get your whole big toe in your mouth? Check this out. Sometimes I wonder if you can get juice from a potato. Is it possible for a teenage girl to drink water upside down? Mmm, I'm thirsty! It's not possible! This has been me in a video! Come on! Give up the juice! This is one of the biggest twists in a UK true crime case that I've ever come across. It was 2015 in Cambridgeshire. Ricardus Pusis, originally from Lithuania, came to the UK for a better life. He was a hardworking man and got a job on a local leek farm. However, things would take a horribly dark turn for Ricardus. He vanished in September 2015. Police were informed that he had left work in Chatteris on the 26th of September. He then met up with a group of other Lithuanian men socially that evening. However, the alarm was raised when he didn't show up to work two days later. Concerningly, his ID badge was then found in a local park. Police received shocking tip-offs, stating that he'd been exploited, and they launched a murder investigation in November 2015. They utilised all resources they had to try and attempt to find his body. Then in December, a breakthrough. A 31-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of murder. Despite having not found Ricardus, the investigation was progressing. The man was questioned about his contact with Ricardus prior to him going missing. Disturbingly, witnesses reported that the pair had got into a physical altercation after the man told Ricardus that he owed him a thousand pounds. The man then allegedly hit Ricardus over the head and blood had been pouring out. Ricardus was then shockingly beaten with a pole and was seen stumbling around. That was the last time the witnesses saw him. However, despite this disturbing account, the man was released by police. 
Frustratingly, the case hit a lot of dead ends and the police were stumped. Then, four years later, in 2019, his sister got a Facebook message. She had obviously feared the worst for her brother after the original murder investigation. However, the Facebook message was of somebody claiming to be Ricardus. She told police she was convinced it was her brother. Investigators actually traced the profile and found that it was being used through the Wi-Fi of a nearby Asda. They obviously had suspicions that this may just be somebody posing as the missing man. And agonizing six months later, after trained negotiators stepped in, Ricardus was found alive. Astonishingly, he'd actually been living in the woods off Haircroft Road for five years. He had a makeshift hut and kept himself remarkably clean. He'd scavenged for food and used old discarded clothing that he found. He even found someone's old phone and was able to use it through the Asda Wi-Fi. He avoided people and stayed in his hut throughout the day. Understandably scared and vulnerable, Ricardus was spoken to by police officers who tried to reassure him. He would eventually speak about his experience. He stated about the beating before he disappeared. It was very painful. I couldn't stand up. I turned around to the door and ran. I didn't know where to go. I turned left. There was a little park. I went to the park and hid in the bushes. The man that was actually released by police during the investigation currently has a warrant out for his arrest over allegations of modern slavery. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, began with drive-by shootings, and culminated in acts of cannibalism. This girl was killed by the cartel in a very brutal way, and whatever you do, don't look up the video. Maria Fernanda Garcia Alvarez was a 16-year-old girl who was executed by some drug cartel members on suspicion of investigating against them. She was missing since July 15th, 2021, and a few months later, a gruesome video of her execution began circulating on gore sites and Reddit. The video is two minutes and 31 seconds long, and the setting looks like some sort of forest or some trail in the woods near a forest. When the video starts, Maria is on her knees with her hands tied behind her back. She is wearing jeans and a white blouse shirt, and the look on her face will keep you up at night. She is surrounded by at least three gang members, the cameraman, the one holding a gun against her head, and the other holding a pretty long knife against her throat. The opening 50 seconds is your usual cartel interrogation. The interrogation is translated to, interrogator demands her name. She replies, Maria Fernanda Garcia Alvarez. The interrogator then asked, who was the person who ordered you to infiltrate us? Maria replies, Fernando Mendoza. The interrogator then asked, who planned all the stuff you're doing? She says Fernando and Francisco. The interrogator then says, tell us the people who infiltrated us. Give us nicknames. She replies Oscar and then another name that can't be made out. Finally, he asked, who did you report to on everything we did? Maria said, Fernando Mendoza. The killer then ends the negotiation by saying, now you'll see why you don't want to play with us. As the video plays out, it is extremely hard to watch. Maria is panic breathing and on the verge of tears. Her killer then proceeds to cut into her throat while holding his hand over her mouth and bringing the knife back and forth like a saw. And while watching, you can instantly tell the knife isn't sharp enough to cut clean through a neck which makes this 100 times worse for Maria. Maria is screaming and screaming while crying hysterically. The sound of this is horrific and will keep you up at night. Eventually, the knife gets through the skin and into her throat. And at this point, Maria's screams change pitch dramatically. She tries to struggle, but the other man holds her in place. Her screams get deeper as the killer continues to cut and cut and cut. For a split second, she manages to move her head, which frees the killer's hand from her mouth. She then lets out a desperately loud scream that you wish you've never heard. The killer then regains control and puts his hand back over her mouth and continues cutting. She is still screaming after a minute of having her throat cut. At this point, it seems like the killer is losing his composure, I would say for Maria's screams, and then takes the tip of the knife and puts it into her throat and pushes it down with his palm, right into Maria's windpipe. And at this point, her screams change in pitch again. You almost hear the scream and air leave her throat. The killer then moves the knife side to side to try and make the wound bigger. And after all this, Maria is still conscious. The killer then proceeds to stab Maria in the stomach a couple times, and seems desperate to get the job done. And it's extremely apparent that this is his first time doing anything like this. 
He then proceeds cutting her throat and stabs a knife again into her body. At this point, Maria's body then goes limp. The killer then looks at the camera and throws up the peace sign, and the video ends. This is truly one of the most sickening cases I've ever researched, and it's a shame stuff like this happens daily. I beg you to never go searching for this video because it's really sickening and sad, and it will honestly just ruin your day or might even ruin weeks of your life. This is the murder of Eric Hingston. Eric was 83 years old when he was murdered. His bedroom window was open, a set of ladders were placed outside, and a scene of open drawers and missing jewellery suggested a robbery gone wrong. But there was something far more sinister that the police had yet to uncover. Eric was a retired butcher, and in his younger years he was a member of Churchill's Special Operations Executive in World War II. He was one of the heroes chosen by Churchill himself to fly behind enemy lines into Germany and set Europe ablaze, defeating the Nazis. A wonderful man who lived a full life. Eric had been married, had children and grandchildren, but tragically lost his wife in the early 80s. Just 18 months after his wife's death, Eric met and married a woman named Audrey. Audrey was also a widow, having lost her husband to a heart attack. Audrey and Eric were both looking for the same thing in the new partner, company. Eric's family called it a marriage of convenience. They both lost their life partners and were lonely. His children were worried that he'd rushed into this marriage and didn't know much about his new wife. As the marriage went on, the couple had an active social life and were known around the village as the local old couple. Unfortunately, as Eric grew older, his health deteriorated. He ended up with a hip replacement, a catheter, and became severely asthmatic. Audrey, begrudgingly, became his carer. The couple's social life soon came to a stop, and Audrey was not happy with this. She hated being stuck inside caring for her sick husband, and soon came up with a plan to get rid of him for good. On August 28, 2003, 81-year-old Audrey put her plan into action. She placed the ladder outside Eric's open bedroom window, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, went up the stairs and stabbed her sleeping husband in the shoulder, breaking his collarbone, which then punctured his lung. This single stab wound was fatal. Audrey then staged a robbery, opening drawers in the bedroom and placing some of her jewellery into black bin bags. She then waited two hours before calling an ambulance, saying, We've been attacked. My husband's on the floor. Please come quickly. I think he's dead. When police arrived, Audrey was really tearful, saying that two men had attacked them, killed Eric, and ransacked the house. Audrey then put out a heartfelt plea for anyone with information to come forwards, and it was surprisingly convincing. Somebody somewhere knows who did this. I ask them, and my family asks them, to please contact the police. If you have any information at all, please pass it to the police. On a personal note, may I thank you for all the love and kindness you've shown us. But please, please do anything you can to help us. Thank you. She even went as far as pointing the finger at two men that she'd seen walking around the village. Thankfully, they had cast iron alibis when questioned by police. After five weeks of looking for Eric's killer, forensic examinations proved that there was nobody else in the house that night, and Audrey's lies unravelled. She eventually confessed to her son that she'd been the one to kill Eric. In March 2004, Audrey pleaded not guilty to murder and instead pleaded guilty to manslaughter due to diminished responsibility. On sentencing Audrey, Mrs Justice Hallett said, It's a very sad day to see a woman of your age and background in the dock for the killing of your husband, and covering it up in such a cold and calculating way. Audrey was sentenced to two years, making her Britain's oldest woman at the time to be jailed. Eric's family were really disappointed with the sentence, saying we feel betrayal, disappointment and anger. If someone kills another person, then they should pay the price. We believe that Audrey should have got at least five years. We've got to accept it, but it's destroyed our faith in the justice system. Audrey served just one year of her two-year sentence and was released in 2005. She then passed away in 2016, aged 83. This is one of the most sickening and disturbing cases I ever covered, and it will make any true crime fan stomach turn. This is the case of Jennifer Dodderty. This case took place in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, which is a relatively small area. Jennifer was 30 years old and was extremely kind and sweet. 
She loved to dance and she trusted everyone she ever encountered. This is because she had some mental disabilities, and this disability even affected her keeping up with her peers in school. And she always got bullied and teased, but she always chose kindness over anything else. She then started going to this community center when she finally thought she met her friends. And these supposed friends were Angela, Peggy, Amber, Melvin, Ricky, and Robert. And you will soon find out why they weren't her friends. These six people all lived together and Angela was 17, who was pregnant with Ricky's baby who was 23 years old. Amber was 20, who was pregnant with Melvin Knight's baby. Peggy was 27, and Robert was 36. Now remember, Jennifer was 30 years old, but due to the mental disability she had, she had the mental capabilities of a 12 to 14 year old person. The six of them and Jennifer hung out for a while, but soon after, Angela became extremely jealous of Jennifer. This is because her boyfriend Ricky would always flirt with Jennifer when they all hung out. So Angela and Amber came up with this whole screwed up plan. On February 10th, 2010, Jennifer was invited to a sleepover with her friends. And before she left, she left a note for her mom that said, Have a great day at work, and I love you very much. Right when Jennifer stepped into the apartment house, she was subjected to 36 hours of extreme hell. The group went through her purse and stole money, gift cards, and her cell phone. They poured liquids into her bag, hit her head with filled soda bottles, cut her hair, painted her face with nail polish, and dumped liquids and spices on her head. They then took turns violently hitting Jennifer with a metal towel rack and crutches. Jennifer was also stripped naked, gagged, and then raped by Melvin. They even forced her to drink cooking oil, nail polish, detergent, different medications, and even urine. And keep in mind, this whole time Jennifer completely trusted them because she thought that they were all her friends but they were literally dehumanizing her. They then continued pouring all of these things and spices on her head and Jennifer was crying that her eyes hurt and she couldn't see, but they didn't listen and continued pouring. And after they decided they tortured her enough, they took her life. They then tied her up in Christmas lights and forced her to write a fake suicide note, essentially saying that everything that happened to her was self-inflicted. The first line reads, I have not been feeling happy for a while now and I also feel everybody will be better off without me. Which is just sad because that wasn't the case. Jennifer was extremely loved. Once the note was written, they got a knife and stabbed Jennifer to death. And once they knew she was dead, they tied her up in Christmas lights again, stuffed her body inside a garbage can, and dumped it in the parking lot of a middle school, where her body would be discovered by a truck driver the next day on February 11th. Even though Angela orchestrated the whole thing, she avoided the death penalty because she was 17 and a minor. But she ended up getting life without parole. Melvin got the death sentence, Ricky was also given the death penalty, and Peggy, Amber, and Robert were given 30 to 72 years in prison. This case is just so sickening and disturbing, and it stuck with me after I read it, and I feel extremely bad for Jennifer and her family. I wish nothing but the worst for those six people who did this to Jennifer woman people are calling the real life gone girl. She faked her own horrific abduction and wasted five years of police time. You're not going to want to miss this one. It is absolutely insane. This all begins November 2nd of 2016. Keith Papini returned home from work at around 5 p.m. He was expecting to come home to his 34 year old wife Sherry Papini and his two kids but they weren't home. Keith called the daycare where his kids were staying and asked when Sherry came to pick up the kids. The daycare then told him that she never came, so the kids were okay. He immediately finds this very strange, calls the police and reports her missing. This was taken very seriously by the police. She seemed to have vanished out of thin air. It wasn't long before the news was reporting on it and her missing posters were all over California. Because there were no leads, Fingers pointed at Keith, the husband. Everyone thought it was Keith. He even took a polygraph test and passed it, but people still thought it was him. That's until 22 days later, when Sherry returned. 150 miles away from where she was last seen, a driver finds her walking on the side of the road in chains. This driver called the police and she was brought in. She was covered in bruises. She had lost weight and her back had been branded. Understandably, police were shocked. 
When asked what happened, she claimed that two Hispanic women abducted her. She claimed that they were going to sell her to a man and that's why she was branded. Police were taking this very seriously. Sherry explained in detail the abuse that she went through and the room she was in. She also described the women enough for them to create a sketch of people who did not exist because it was all a lie. Police found it very strange that these abductors just let her go, but this isn't to say that they didn't believe her. They definitely did and they took it very seriously. They were determined to find out who did this to this poor mother of two. The government helped pay for therapy for her PTSD and anxiety after this event. During this time, police were testing her clothes and they finally found DNA. This DNA belonged to a man, not a woman and she apparently encountered no men during this kidnapping. They put it through the police database and nothing came up. That's until 2020 when they decided to put it through a genealogy database, hoping that someone related to the person with this DNA went on like ancestry or anything like that. With this, they were able to find the exact person with that DNA. And this person was Sherry's ex-boyfriend. The story only gets crazier from here, so come back for part two. It'll be up the moment I'm done filming.